This is Other Voices. We're listening to varied views from local people who might otherwise not be heard. I'm Melissa Hale, Spencer Editor of the Altamont Enterprise, which focuses on Albany County, New York. I'm talking to Tom Breitenbach. He built with his own hands the castle where he lives on the shoulder of the Helderberg Escarpment. He started to paint in earnest after a Gilderland High School classmate gave a presentation on Salvador Dali and Hieronymus Bosch. The fascination lasted a lifetime. At 24, Breitenbach painted proverb idioms, depicting over 300 common proverbs and cliches, which made him famous. More recently, he wrote and produced a musical about Hieronymus Bosch, the medieval Dutch artist who, like Breitenbach himself, gets lost in his imagination. The fantastical creatures he paints inhabit his home. Sure. Well, actually, I was born in Queens Village in Queens, New York, so I was a city boy. And, uh, and then we moved out to Seaford, Long Island, for a few years, uh, but I was surrounded by artistic parents. My father was an architect. My mother did some a Sunday painting and uh, taught me some musical instruments. Uh, and they both performed in community theater. So I'd o- often hear them on the piano harmonizing some of those old tunes from way back. Uh, but then uh, we used to visit my uncle's farm up here in beautiful Schoharie Valley, and we decided, hey, we want to live in the, a rural setting. So we bought a beautiful property up the hill uh, on 146, and uh, we, together we all built uh, my father's home. And uh, so I was maybe 11 years old when we did that, so I learned uh, uh, some building crafts there. And uh, in the years following, my mother and I would uh, do the built the uh, dry stone walls around the house. Uh, that got me interested in the stonework. And um, but I was also especially interested in the, in the natural world all around me. I was scared at first. I came up here and I saw these gigantic bumblebees you have up here that we don't have on Long Island. <laughs> I said, "What am I getting myself in for?" But they're actually really nice. They don't go after you. <laughs> And I thought I'd have to wear boots in the woods because of all the snakes I was going to see. But uh, I started collecting uh, field guides and learning all the trees and the flowers and the mushrooms and the ferns. And, but I especially was interested in butterflies and insects. I started a collection and met my best friend a year later who was doing the same thing. And, uh, and that collection is on display now, or part of it, at the Altamont Library, Butterflies from Around the World. Right. Those, those were mostly purchased, and a few were from Europe that I, I may have collected myself. I had a pen pal over there, too. We exchanged butterflies. Um, and then I continued to do uh, my music. I wasn't really ever interested in being a painter. I you know, knew how to draw and, st- and things like that, but I, I wrote poetry, and I... Um, Played lots of music and joined a rock and roll band. We played at Goodall in high school occasionally. And um, when I went to college, we did some... I was in a jazz band for a year. Um, But uh, I was actually going to... So I wanted to be an entomologist when I grew up, the the study of insects. Uh, And... uh, But I eventually turned to architecture, my father's profession. He opened up an office in his basement of his home. And he had several employees, and I would watch them and study them. And I kept making designs for my own house, which were very kind of modern-looking, not, not a castle, but Frank Lloyd Wright kind of houses. So I was interested in him. Well, the inside of your house reminds me of Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah, my father was you into You know, it's him. very clean <laughs> lines and built-ins. And the big and overhangs, you yeah, know, to keep the sun out in the yeah. summer and things like that. And, uh, you know, built-in areas. Uh, there is some of that in the inside of my castle, the Frank mm-hmm. Lloyd Wright stuff. Right. Um, but um, but tell us about, I think you told me once um, that you were a senior at Gilderland High School and a classmate of yours made a presentation on Salvador Dali and Hieronymus Bosch, two painters you never heard of. Right. And that inspired you to paint, is that right? That inspired me to start doing some actual paintings, but I had taught myself to paint already because I was decorating. Uh, I got into building, after I built my butterfly cases, (laughs) I built um, some wooden butterfly cases. I built some uh, uh, five different grandfather clocks, and because I I built one for myself, and then I... And how did you know how to do that? 
Uh, I, I don't know, but we went down to Williamsburg, Virginia, and, uh, and I found a book down there that told, gave you plans for one. It's not really that hard. I mean, I didn't build, build the works part. You built the cabinetry. Right, but I built the cabinet, and then I had to decorate the dials, and then I built a clavichord and a harpsichord and some music boxes. And you still have that in your, in your house. Yeah, I've seen it. I used to copy. And you did this as a high school student. Yeah. Yeah, wow. And I did this, uh, yes, I had a little business going with the grandfather clocks. And then uh, uh, teaching myself to paint, I um, used to copy flowers off of uh, birthday cards and things. But since I didn't know what I was doing, I, I, I didn't quite do it quite right like the pictures, but, I, but somehow mine stu- stood out and uh, were more 3D than, than the pictures there. And I kind of learned some old masterly kind of tricks that <laughs> make them really pop out. So I, I started doing paintings after learning about Dolly and Bosch. And I did a big canvas before I went to college. But I, I was also drafting. Uh, I was a full-time draftsman that summer before college because I had learned the craft and I was helping my father. I did some drawings for, the, for a hospital edition he was doing in Messina. And then uh, so I went to architecture school. And this was in Notre Dame. Yeah, Notre Dame. Yeah, it was Notre Dame or RPI, because it was last minute. I actually wanted to be a lawyer <laughs> because of the Perry Mason series. I thought that was so clever how he'd Oh, Perry Mason. My grandparents <laughs> used to watch that, and he always, he always solved it by the time the hour was over. <laughs> it was a Right, so that, I briefly was going to be a lawyer. But so at last minute, I got into Notre Dame and RPI, but I would have had to take summer school physics to get into RPI. So I went to Notre Dame. But I became very bored there very quickly because we were back to basics, and I already had learned so much of this stuff from my father. I'd been to bid openings, and uh, I'd, I'd, I'd done surveying, and I, I'd drawn the plans and things like that. So uh, he, the professor let me, in my second semester, design my own house instead of doing the other projects everyone else was assigned to. But he only gave me a C, and I was kind of pissed off about that <laughs> <laughs> for all that work. Uh, meanwhile, I, meanwhile, I had been painting in my room at the school uh, more, more of these little paintings, and they had a student art show for, that anyone could join, and I put them up in the, in the room and uh, came back later to listen to people's comments, and I was really surprised. Uh, oh, I heard he's a chemistry major, and he must be on drugs and all kinds of funny, <laughs> funny things, but it was interesting to get, get these reactions. And, so describe some of those early paintings for us. Well, they were a little bit more surrealistic, like Dolly, with the hard black shadows. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but um, I quickly got into a more allegorical stuff. They're very dark. My early paintings are very dark, um, moralistic kind of paintings, because that was the Vietnam era, and everybody at school was protesting that. And I had a kind of an idyllic childhood, but when I got out there... You know, there was, I, I witnessed uh, a guy stealing from the bookshop and, you know, there's crime and politics and every, everything else going on. And I started to think mankind was hopelessly uh, irrational and violent. So my paintings sort of address a lot of that. And the, the at, ones. at what point, you were still at Notre Dame when you contacted Jim Morrison of the Doors, is that right? Yeah, so I, I was painting really well by that time and, and started doing more Bosch-like things. And I sent him a, a picture of one of my paintings and asked him if I could do an album cover. And um, believe it or not, he responded favorably. And he told me his ideas and sent me some of his private editions of poetry, which he signed. Uh, to get ideas from for the center panel. And he described the side panels. It was going to be a triptych. Uh, it turned out, I found out more recently, that he was a lover of Hieronymus Bosch, too. So I kind of hit him at the right time. And he And saw, just for people who aren't familiar with Hieronymus Bosch, can you describe, because your paintings do have a lot in common with them, just describe, if you would, th- that painting style. Well, there's one famous one he did called, called The Garden of Earthly Delights. And even though a lot of people, I find, don't know his name, they, re- they recognize a painting from somewhere. You know, they've been on album covers. And, and that's a triptych. Different places. And that's a three-piece yeah, triptych. So the wings fold up. It was a custom during Advent, Advent to close up the altarpiece and uh, cover the statues in the, in the Catholic Church. Uh, but... Um, yeah, and it's all full of this fa- these fantasy figures. Uh, but they're very precisely painted. It's not like Impressionism. or it, They're very 
each one of your figures is so crisp and vivid there. Um, I'm just trying to think of a way to describe it to somebody that hasn't seen it. Just infinitesimal detail and very, very bright colors. Um, so I interrupted your narrative there. <laughs> but So Jim Morrison, you corresponded and you painted this triptych for his it's album cover. For him. It was kind of hellish looking. It's not, not pretty. In, in fact, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> My first art show locally I ever had was in 1972 at the Schenectady Museum, and that was the first painting you walked into, and some woman showed up, took one look at that, and turned around <laughs> and wouldn't go see the rest of the show. It's, oh. it's not a pretty picture, but his poetry was uh, uh, like that, and he wanted to use it on his album of poetry called uh, The American Prayer, which was done uh, seven years after his death. Uh, so the producer didn't know about uh, the, the project, uh, so it didn't make it on there. And only uh, was found out about uh, years later when the Internet came out, and I had it on my website. And since then, it's gotten into a couple of biographies of his. And there was a film company from Spain contacted me recently. They're trying to do, uh, maybe I should say this for another time. but No, go ahead. But they're trying to do a, a documentary about his last days. So he died, you know, a few months after I had made this painting. And uh, he was coughing up blood, and his doctor told him, you got to take some time off. So he went, to Par- he went to Paris with his girlfriend, Pamela, and they were, he had three specific places he wanted to visit. And one of them was the Prado in Spain to, to see the Ron Wasbach triptych. And that's why I hit him at just the right time. He had already had an interest in Ron Wasbach and, and an interest in triptychs. And... Uh, so uh, I, I, that's part of the story. <laughs> yeah. Well, the painting that you're probably most famous for is the f- proverb idiom. And when when was that in this nar- narrative? You were at Notre Dame. When did you paint that? Uh, I left Notre Dame after my junior year. I got a fellowship, to, a Rome Prize fellowship to go to Italy. I'm just bringing this up now because it has to do with building the castle. Yeah. Uh, and then... Uh, came home and decided to start work, working on my house. And then meanwhile, I painted th- that, and I finished it in 1975. It took two years. And that is just describe. What is the size of that? Um, so I, th- I think it's a little more than five feet wide. It's, it's big. a pretty big one and very detailed, but it, it contains 300 proverbs and idioms, all painted literally and humorously. So, so um, they're like visual puns. Right. <laughs> it's just this painting you can look at and look at and look at and look at, and the more you look, the more you see. Right, so there's like a carrot eating a carrot. That's you are what you eat. And there's a head on the ground with a, a screw kind of neck. Uh, you'd forget your head if it wasn't screwed on. And there's a rat race, some rats with uh, numbers on their side, and things like that. Well, so what inspired you to do that? It wasn't exactly my idea. There was a popular movement in in the, ne- the Netherlands. Uh, there's an artist called uh, Peter Bruegel, who I mm-hmm. actually resemble more than Bosch. Uh, and he did one of Netherlandish proverbs. And he copied a lot of that, I found out, from another engraver. But uh, he uh, did, did uh, there were about 87 in his picture. But I read a, a biography about it. And the fellow s- made a comment about how much more colorful life was uh, language was back then, and I started to think about all the funny things we say. <laughs> yeah, and I just it just became a challenge from that point. And I so much loved doing it, and so much loved all the reaction from people. It's brought so many smiles to people over the years, and and so on. And uh, uh, so I kept doing them. I did three other proverb idioms uh, pictures of general sayings, and I did a, a whole bunch more from different topics. I know you did one on Shakespearean sayings. Shakespeare, but, gardening, food, sports. Uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch. Uh, health. That, that one's real popular. A picture of health. That's more recent. Um, so how, like, how does your mind work? <laughs> that you, like, you're listening to someone talk and you suddenly think, oh, I can see how that would be. Do you keep like notes on like these? Yeah, that's the problem. That- uh, I don't. I can't concentrate on stuff because I get an, I get ideas from everything. Yeah. <laughs> I can't read a not, I can't read a book anymore. I read a few paragraphs and then I see something. I get an idea. So I hold on to those, and you know, maybe thirty years later, I finally get to paint it, and I keep a notebook of uh, 
all my ideas for paintings and, and other types of projects too. Um, and so when did it come to you to not just build your own house but to build a castle? You said your time in Europe inspired the right. idea of a castle, is that? So I came back a year early from my uh, fellowship and uh, wanted to start working on my house. Uh, you know, having watched my father and helped my father build a house, I wanted to build my own as well. So he gave me 30 acres of land. And I didn't have a lot of money at the time, but I had stone all over the property. And I had... Uh, Helderberg bluestone. Yep. And, and a big creek in the back uh, where I could quarry stone. Some of them are 12 feet long, believe it or not. And they come up like cut stone, big, long, straight pieces. And... Um, I was reading a book called The Octagon House by Orson Fowler. And if you've seen some of the villages around here, Schoharie and Duanesburg, Delanson, they have an octagon house. And I've seen octagon barns, too. Yeah. And these were inspired by his book. Uh, he talked about how much more economical it was to build a, a round building, a roundish building. Uh, it was cheaper to build, and it was, there was less, because there's less, less exterior surface, and it was cheaper to heat. And uh, that and the stones and all the castle, beautiful castles I had seen, it just, it just spelled castle. <laughs> so I started with an octagon shape about 36 feet across with a big tall tower attached. And the year before, I cast uh, 250 parts for it, a spiral staircase and window and door frames. And how did you learn how to do that? Oh, well, I did help my father a couple summers. Uh, besides building his house, I helped him build some other houses uh, for a while. There's a, a Meadowdale development on Altamont Boulevard was one of them. And uh, so I learned how to cast uh, concrete there. Because my whole house is concrete. Even the basement ceiling is concrete. I wanted it to be fireproof. I had a friend in, in Rome who lost 20 years of his artwork because his studio burned down. Oh, so yours, your house can never burn down. Well, I guess the roof could, but yeah. it, it's pretty pretty solid. It's like you can't even use wireless inside your house anymore because you go from one room to the next and it disappears. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All that concrete. Uh, yeah, so it kind of spelled castle, and I started working on that, and, and I got a, a barn that was collapsing from a neighbor. So I got all kinds of beautiful siding and big beam, heavy beams, and uh, so that was perfect. So I've been, I used to paint for eight months out of the year and then work on that for four. And I there's a romantic story here because you had a party oh. when you put the roof on your house <laughs> and a woman showed up that you did not know, Deborah Barnes. Right. Is this is this story correct? That's true. I didn't invite her. <laughs> she was brought by another friend I invited and... Uh, she was the only one that left her phone number in the, in the guest book, too. But we, we hung out a little bit at the party, and I liked her very much and asked her out. And we got married exactly a year to the day uh, uh, when I met her there. And I, you showed me the place where you were married, under these two ancient oak trees on the property. And she has since made, Deborah has since made, what do you call the maze like oh, things? She made a giant you, labyrinth in the woods? Yes, a yeah. labyrinth there. Yeah, Yeah, we have stonework just everywhere. You can, I didn't even have to put a foundation in the, uh, or footings in the house. You know, we, we struck rock, you know, three feet down. So <laughs> so every time we build, and uh, there's stone every place. So, yeah, she built a giant labyrinth. Uh, it's 400 feet to the center if you walk it all. And then uh, you know, we had a stone heart where we got married, and We've since I've since been upgrading the stone walls. I built a big giant arch out of uh, some leftover giant rocks that the highway department had pulled up a few years ago, and uh, built a blacksmith shop and a barn. And I, I continue to cut up the dead oak trees for future projects. And so here you are with a beautiful home and an established career as an artist. What made you decide? to write a musical yourself, the music, the lyrics, the, uh, the scenery, everything. Yeah, so a friend of mine, uh, uh, the same one I used to collect insects with, he's uh, quite a virtuoso on the piano, and he used to play at the New York State Theater, Theater Institute, and he invited me to a, uh, an original musical that they were presenting there. He had some extra tickets, 
and I was Snow so, Queen, I think you said it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And it was so uh, so nice being the, in, right in the audience with the same actors and actresses. It was just a different feeling than watching a movie. And, uh, and, and it was so creative, and I just said right then and there, this is something I want to try, because <laughs> I like being challenged. I've, I've been a little bored with painting, because once I learned to do something really well, I like to try other things. So, And I already had all this uh, music background, and I had composed songs, actually. I even won a talent show at Goodland High School, first place for me and a local Tommy Capuano. We uh, wrote some songs. Really? I, I brought my harpsichord there, yeah. And so you performed the songs you we wrote, you and Tom Capuano? Oh, yep, my and, uh, goodness. And we won first place. And... Uh, so I started writing it one day, but it was about Hieronymus Bosch, my favorite artist, and some of it's even autobiographical. Um, you know, because if anyone can get behind, into Hieronymus Bosch's head, it'd be somebody like me who paints like him. So, um, so that uh, I, so I did that. And, and the I, musical is wonderful, and people can actually see it because you had it recorded. Part of part of it. Tell us about how. How you went about making the musical? Sure. So uh, when I was still writing it, I needed to. Uh, I uh, ran it by a lot of people. We did some studio readings, and we did one at at NISTI, and then uh, we did a workshop at Guildhall High School many years back. And then I always wanted to do a major production, a big community production of it, and film it for public television. So finally, when I, I found the time. And uh, everything else, all the stars lined up. Um, I collaborated. I went to WMHT first, actually, and told them what I wanted to do, and they were very excited about it. They were familiar with my artwork. And um, so they wrote me some letters, which helped me with the fundraising, and, and uh, I ended up contracting with the Proctors for their main stage and with the Schenectady Light Opera. And, um, and then I got... Uh, Eight class, eight art classes from six different high schools to make creature masks. Uh, for because the storyline, just so people know, is Hieronymus paints these creatures who are so real to him they actually come to life, and when he falls in love, his beloved is freaked out. <laughs> At and first, decisions yeah. have to be made, but um, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's the that's the, the, the tagline is the story of an artist with a too large imagination, and it's like um, it reflects, like I said, it's autobiographical to some point. So, like my wife would come home sometimes and say, "How can you stand to be home alone all the time?" And I tell her, "Because I'm not alone. It's like I'm not even here." <laughs> I really am existing in these other worlds that I'm thinking about and contemplating. Well, you, just to you, take a little side trip, too, you have a whole set of creatures that you've made, and you, new, the new creatures? I mean, you've, you've oh, created your own I did a book, set yeah, of creatures. I did an illustrated yeah. novel. It's, uh, and I, now that I was just listening to you saying how as a kid you got all these field guides to learn about what the plants were and what the insects were, and then you also have a field guide that you've made of these creatures yeah, you've created. Yeah, with their, I just did a podcast with a woman who wrote about um, the man who you know made all the classifications <laughs> that we use, and... Um, it just you've done that yourself for your made-up creatures, which is kind of amazing. Yeah, it was a novel, but the appendix has all of this. It's just like a field guide. It's got uh, some 300 creatures all described with Latin names and what they do, and, and they represent different emotions. So the character, when he goes through the, the lands that he ends up getting stuck in, um, whatever he's thinking or whatever his mood is uh, determines what kind of creatures he ends up getting mixed mixed up with. Uh, the, uh, the Enterprise actually did a story about that way, way back. Yeah, right. Uh, that was probably in the Bryce 80s. Bryce Butler wrote it. Yeah, probably yeah. in the 80s, I think. Yep. Uh, so I never got to publish it. I kept adding to it, and I published it as an e-book, so it's like on, on Amazon. Um, yeah. But back to Hieronymus, so he has these creatures, and they're wonderful when they come to life on stage. Um, they really... Yeah, so all these schools made these creature masks for us, and then we had a, a dan dance company join us with all their best teachers and students, and we had uh, 
the Society for Creative Anachronism, who does uh, the, their medieval. Uh, uh, they they have medieval costumes and things, and um, we had some 250 people all together. We did a uh, rehearsed we rehearsed it at Snackley Light Opera, and then we did the big production and filmed filmed it for public television at uh, at Proctor's main stage there. And uh, eventually, that uh, the film was finished, and we did, had a showing there in the GE Theater, f- mostly for the people involved. And uh, finally. Uh, WMST, it's a little bit too long for them to easily fit into their on-the-air schedule, but uh, Robert Altman decided uh, to put it up as a special feature uh, online, and then they did an AHA piece, uh, A House for the Arts. It's one of their shows about art, uh, about the making of Hieronymus. And um, that ended up going to some 160-plus stations, is as many as I was able to count just doing searches. <laughs> That's about half of them across. So it went everywhere from the Virgin Islands to Hawaii and all over the pla- all over the place. So, uh, so it's on their website as a special feature. The, the whole thing is, and the Aha piece got aired all over the place. So if you'd like to see it, I set up a website to make it easy to link to called OurMusical.com. OurMusical.com, and there's some menus on there, and you can go see the whole film, or you can. Watch the briefer piece about making it, and there's also a documentary on there about the playwright. So, what's next? <laughs> I mean, is there more that you want to do? Um, I'm getting older, and I'm feeling a little more urgency to get things done. So, I'm uh, I have a few projects I want to finish. One, I want to do one gigantic triptych like Hieronymus Bosch's. So his was like 12 feet wide or something like that. Will this fit in your studio? Is, is it- yeah, that's, that's the thing I have to figure out. Yeah. We did make a replica of his, of his triptych for the show, and that's in my garage. I have the coolest garage in town. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you, you drive do. in, and this is 14 foot wide with the frame. Uh, uh, <laughs> beautiful triptych. Uh, and I also want to uh, write sort of an autobiography and book of essays to put down ideas that I haven't put into my paintings. And then I'm also giving my house and my paintings away. I've always wanted it to be a museum someday. I used to know this painter. Uh, he was down in uh, Hillsdale in the Catskills. And uh, he was Swiss, and he was a really amazing painter. He could paint as well as anybody in any style you can think of, and he should be famous. But if you're not connected and you aren't part of the system down in New York, you know, you just don't get really heard of. Like, like there's a lack of female artists down there. It was a real boys' club in the mm. old days. Where's all the female, art, famous female artists? Um, so when he died, his work just kind of disappeared, and I always felt sad about that. I found out years later it was all auctioned off for about $100 a piece, and uh, oh. I, I wish I had acquired someone I was familiar with. And, uh, yeah, he had taken me under my wing when I was uh, very young and, and uh, was very inspirational. But um, but I also got inspiration while I was becoming an artist from places like Olana and uh, Opus 40. And I used to love to go to the Munson William Proctor's Museum to see uh, Thomas Cole's The Voyage of Life. I, I love that allegorical, allegorical series of paintings. And I wanted to leave something behind. I know people really do like my paintings. I've gotten so much fan mail and sold so many posters over the years. And... Um, People from all around the world. I mean, it's amazing. Oh, yeah. There's, uh, there's, there were two groups that used to use them for their educational value to teach foreign students about our language because we use so many cliches that we really confuse the heck out of Oh, my people. goodness. The, he, the one guy told me it's been to 100 countries uh, that way. Uh, but it's gotten around. And in fact, there's a young fellow who grew up with... Uh, one of my Proverbs pictures in in New Zealand, and he contacted me, you know, ten years ago, and he has a Proverbidium's app out that you can you can get online. And uh, yeah, it's gotten all over. I sold a quarter million of the original Proverbidium's posters. I mean, so I stopped when, once I was making a living from that. The posters and licenses for jigsaw puzzles and calendars and things like that. I was able to not sell any paintings anymore. So I've kept them all. And I'm giving them away. I'm writing a irrevocable trust right now, and I, I just started filing for a nonprofit. 
and I want it to be a museum someday so that all the work can be enjoyed and appreciated and uh, won't get lost like uh, Mr. Hansiger's had. How remarkable. So all of your paintings are still in your castle. Mm-hmm. Wow. So if we can, once I get... I know you've painted some to give away. I remember with the mask contest. Wasn't the prize one of your paintings? Yes. Yeah. That was amazing. <laughs> it was probably worth about $10,000. $10,000 prize student. for a high school. I was very excited about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping to get some people to do some super big, more than just a mask, but some really huge yeah. costumes. I didn't quite get there, but, but the, the kids did a really great job. and. And uh, the, our choreographer, uh, Denise Baker from Scotia, uh, well, just Scotia the- Glenville, did a fabulous job of uh, doing these big dances with the creatures and things like that. Well, just the energy in Proctor's for that performance, you could just feel it surge, not just from the stage, but from the audience. <laughs> it, was, it was really magical. That's great. We got good reactions from it. And people said yeah. oh, as soon as it was over, they wanted to see it again. So that, that's a good sign. Yeah. So I was hoping maybe you would get some exposure for, uh, through a public TV and maybe someday get it to Broadway. Who knows? So our time has gone really fast. Do you have any closing thoughts? Any? I mean, there's so many avenues we could have walked down in your life that we couldn't we couldn't explore even all of them. But just. Anything we left out that's really important for people to know? Well, or? I could note, though, that occasionally our castle is on tour. Um, with this new virus going around, I don't know what's going to happen. But, oh. but uh, yeah, once we were on the Victorian Days tour in, the, in December, that was a and little you, hard because of the snow, but we're usually on the Hilltowns uh, farm The Hilltown Annual Tour, tour. And yeah. The, the whole house isn't open, but the studio is in the grounds. You could look out for that. Uh, that's usually in September, the middle yeah. of September. And uh, any life advice? I mean, you've had such a diverse advice. and fascinating in so many different directions. Um, uh, well, you know, definitely study art. Some of the schools cut back on art. Art yeah. is important because if you can visualize something in your head and produce it with your hands, that that helps you in everything you do in your life. Um, and that's why I was able to do so many different types of. Uh, Types of art, you know. I just. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, that's an, actually it's another long story. Never mind. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> we have time. What's that? Well, I just. No, it's not because it also involves past lives. It's really a complicated thing. Past lives. I believe lives? in past lives too. Uh, all right, here's all right. This is funny. <laughs> <laughs> I had this really, really, really intense dream one night, maybe thirty-five years back, that I was Ramos Bosch's nephew. And the dream was he had just died, and I was in the, his studio, and I remember it in full detail. And his, his, um, his two men were deciding what, what they should give me out of his estate. So they gave me some drawings with little egg people. I've never seen them anywhere in any of his books. And, uh, and there's other th- things where I just run into a person, and I, I just feel like I know that person. I just swear I know that person. So I've always believed in that. And... Uh, one day, my wife had some dowsers over to her house, these people that search for, for water with the sticks mm-hmm, and stuff. Mm-hmm. And they use pendulums and things like that sometimes. Um, but the one guy said to me, after walking through my house, he, he, your work reminds me of Ron with Spash. And I said, oh, isn't that funny? Because I had this dream, and I feel like I was his nephew. And by the way, he had all these people in his family named Thomas. Isn't that funny? Yeah. <laughs> and I researched him. I couldn't find his nephew's names, but there were so many artists in his family, so okay. it's possible. And the guy said, uh, so they took out their pendulums, and they thought about it. Yeah, we, th- we believe you are, and, and the reason you have all these skills is because you're a very old soul. You've been doing all these different types of art forms all these years. Uh, and there's more to it than that, but uh, so... Uh, so, you know, I've studied it, that, and I, I really do believe in it, actually. <laughs> well, whatever it is that gives you that, it's something that you, out of you, you have things to share with everybody else, you know? And it's you've, a marvel. You've been very kind. Thank you, Melissa. Well, thank you.